This is a story that Pudgy's mama told Pudgy when Pudgy was little before she went away. It is the story of how Pudgy's grandparents escaped their original home in the United Kingdom to bring their daughter to live in these lands. While there are no naughty words, some parts of this story may be too difficult for little ones. Pudgy suggests parents listen to story first and make decision accordingly whether they can watch this video. Chapter 4 Baltimore In the weeks that followed, the HMS Caroline navigated the treacherous waters of the Atlantic Ocean. The ship had joined two other British naval vessels and had formed a protective convoy. One vessel was a commercial that was loaded with various consumer products and sundry items. The other ship was a fishing vessel that had been converted for defensive purposes. The ship was originally used for hunting whales and had visible guns that would shoot harpoons at the aquatic animals. However, where harpoon guns once were mounted, they had been replaced with anti-aircraft guns. At the stern of the ship, where the trolling nets were once stored, Huge metal racks full of depth charges were primed for deployment. All Allied Ocean sailing ships had to travel in groups, escorted by either the British or United States navies. This was due to the German Navy utilizing submarines called U-boats. The underwater weapons of war were manned by small crews of German naval forces and would strike without warning. While the relative safety of the convoys helped towards the human dangers, the ocean surface conditions were horrid, with 20-foot waves tossing the ships up and down via violent storms. Even Mother Nature was seemingly assisting the Germans and the silent machines traveled smoothly underneath the water's surface, waiting for the opportunity to strike. And to make matters worse, the storms were pelting the ships with deluges of water and strong winds. On board the Caroline, the captain of the ship gave no thought about the stowaway hedgehogs on board. He had bigger issues at hand, to ensure the vessel did not sink during its transatlantic voyage. The critters had managed to exit their wooden crate packed with mail to explore their surroundings. The cargo hold was loaded with hundreds of crates, all strapped to wooden pallets that had hooks on the top for the crane hoist to connect to. As they explored, the hedgehogs found that the humans had packed food in the various containers mixed in with the packages. Philip's discovery of biscuits packed in an easily opened tin was very much appreciated by his wife. Once procured, the two hedgehogs learned that the British woman who had baked the biscuits didn't know what she was doing. Their taste was quite bland, but sufficed for their hungry bellies. Neither of the critters had been aware of the British government rationing foodstuffs and that the availability of sugar was hit or miss.
since all supplies were needed to be sent to the front to support the war efforts. It was not long when Philip and Margaret were soon accompanied by a couple dark gray rats, as well as a few white mice as well. Their new acquaintances provided some much needed detail as to their situation in exchange for some biscuits, of course. The group of animals sat on the various pieces of mail while they nibbled away at their cookies, or biscuits as they're called in Britain. The hedgehogs were on a ship, which would take almost a month to reach the opposite shores. The mice spoke of the hustle and bustle of New York and their cousins who ate strange things called bagels. It was dough that was boiled, then baked, and sold by the dozen. Occasionally, one would fall down, or the stale ones would be tossed out behind the bakeries. If their rat cousins were quick enough, they could steal them before the poor humans could find them. Margaret, at first, was eating a lot, more so than usual. Each day, until the weather conditions ensured that no one could hold down anything. Though by that point, Margaret's condition swung in the other direction. She was sick often and complaining about indescribable pain throughout her body. Philip tried to make her as comfortable as he could while worrying about his wife. One day, as the male hedgehog was busy collecting fresh water from a leaking pipe into a tiny metal thimble, a female mouse, who had never told him her name, started tugging at his quills. Philip turned around and smiled while he spoke. Why, hello there. I'm gathering water for Margaret. Uh, you can use the thimble next. The female mouse twitched her nose, sending her whiskers wiggling occasionally. Did you know that Margaret is pregnant? Mama says she should give birth any day now. The male hedgehog's paws wavered as he wiggled his nose. Nodding, he carefully carried the water in the thimble. But his mind was racing. They had been trying for many seasons now. Why now, when things were so dangerous? The hedgehog scampered with his mouse friend to head back to the cargo hold. Thankfully, it was not too far, and he soon found his wife whimpering as she whittled her nose. Setting the thimble of water down carefully, Philip reached out and took her paw. No words were spoken, only the sounds of her wailing. The mice soon gathered and assisted as best they could, trying not to listen to the screams of Margaret. A mixture of afterbirth fluids escaped from her and stained the pieces of mail in the crate where she was resting. Eventually, a tiny hedgehog emerged from within her body, translucent white with a shade of pink. The gathered water was useful to wash the child as well as to refresh Margaret. The baby hedgehog squeaked softly and when offered by the field mouse to her female hedgehog mother, she smiled weakly and snuggled with her child. Philip bounced happily, wanting very much to hold them both, but realized that both of them had a really long day, so he decided to keep his distance. Instead, the new father was soon running back and forth, getting water, food, pieces of cloth to serve as blankets for his new family. The rats started to arrange pieces of correspondence stacking around the mother and child, trying to insulate them in the cargo hold, as the temperatures inside were quite cold. The white mice wiggled their noses as they stared at the baby hedgehog with its tiny spikes all over its body. Margaret smiled happily before snuggling with her child and whispering. Abigail, 
how I waited so very long for you to come. Philip was there for the announcement of his daughter's name, and he bounced happily as Abigail was a good name for a daughter. As the days turned into weeks, both mother and child recovered from their ordeal. Philip was an exhausted wreck, however, as he was moving nonstop the entire time. He was getting scant amounts of, of sleep, since both of his loved ones needed him. Thankfully, the ship had stopped moving so violently, apparently due to lack of storms and the choppy surface conditions of the ocean. The rhythmic rumble of the ship's engines remained constant. However, one day, the ship started to move strangely. The engines died down, and the entirety of the ship began to shudder. Loud noises could be heard, and the humans were barking orders at one another in, in muffled tones. Soon, the cargo hold hatches began to open one by one. Humid air started to waft down from outside, and a warm sun beamed overhead. The various critters of the cargo hold quickly scampered to hide in their respective mail crates. All listened to the humans speaking as they worked, and watched as a big hook on a chain descended down into the hold. Somewhere outside, an unseen crane was lifting the pallets of correspondence and supplies via the metal pallets and the pallets rigging. A white mouse twitched her nose while hiding under a letter addressed to a Herman Smith and sniffed the air. This isn't the York. It doesn't smell right. Philip nodded, pulling a large envelope over Margaret and Abigail. The family of hedgehogs snuggled together as their pallet was soon connected to the crane hoist, and the metal pallet was started to be lifted out of the cargo hold. They could see through the slats the wooden crate. As it exited the hold, that the ship had been docked in a huge port. There was blue-green water that had a unique smell wafting from it. It was a mixture of seawater and something foul, probably from something burning nearby. There were humans everywhere, and they were dressed in uniforms of white, and they were positioning the various pallets on the docks beside the ship. One by one, the pallets were lifted over the deck of the HMS Caroline, over the side of the ship, and down to rest securely on the dock. Once each pallet of materials was safely positioned, the hoist hook would be disconnected by a uniformed human, and the crate would be moved into place while the crane would move its long boom arm to send the hoist back into the ship's cargo hold. Margaret could just barely see beneath her covering of letters that a human sailor pointed while the human passengers were di disembarking from the ship. To her horror, the mother watched as two men in black coats left the ship. They were accompanied by two dogs who petted alongside but uh, behind but behind them. Oi, William, take a look at the, look at those bloody bastards. How they escaped the draft. A second sailor laughed and made a rude hand gesture towards the businessman. Eh, well, laddie, probably aristocrats. Don't you know us common folk die in their wars? Oi, what's wrong with this crate? The letters are all stained. An imposing older man walked up. It must have been their commanding officer. You two blokes got time to talk? Maybe I should have signed some more work.
The men shook their heads and returned to their task of loading the wooden crates from the pallets. They were moving the crates and boxes onto nearby wheeled metal push carts. As the hoist raking pallets were emptied and their transport cart became full, the carts were then pushed by another sailor down the dock. One by one, the carts were moved by teams of humans and snaked their way down the various piers, docks, and concrete barricades until they reached a long line of metal carts lined up in a tightly packed single file row. The critters stayed silent and did not move, since their discovery would only complicate matters. In time, as the humans disappeared, the mice signaled it was time to go. They had done these escape plans many times before, and while this was a new port of call, the same rules applied. In a quick motion, the rats, the mice, and the hedgehogs all scampered through the openings of their crates. Sliding down the metal cart, they headed until the group of four field mice, two rats, and three hedgehogs were underneath the wheeled metal carts. Abigail was clutching tightly under her mother's quills on her back, while Margaret scampered as quickly as she could with Philip. Being led by the gray rats, the group of critters ran as fast as they were able to underneath the heavily packed carts, and underneath a large sign that said, All goods must be checked through customs. There was also a sign which directed the humans to head left and towards a structure where they would be sorted. The mice pointed, and soon every animal was making a mad dash towards the exterior wall of a large human structure. There was a hole in the side of the warehouse building, and one by one, they snuck inside. Just as Philip's rear end squeezed through the hole, two dogs and the black-dressed uh, humans walked past. The dogs sniffed the air and barked, turning and pointing their noise noses towards the building. Weiss nodded while speaking discreetly. Fang. Claw. Search. The dogs instinctively set forth with their task and started to sniff the ground. They followed the metal carts where Customs was located. Rudolph looked around, adjusting his black hat according to to hide his eyes. Weiss and Fang were on the left, while Rudolph and Claw were on the right of the metal carts. Checking the wooden crates quickly, each human would move on to the next until the carts from the Caroline were located. Claw barked twice, and Rudolph investigated one crate whose leathers were all stained red. Cursing in German softly, he reached inside only to find foul-smelling stained leathers. There was no codex located inside, but the dog had already started to move on and head forward again. As the two humans reached the end of the carts, they were continuing inside a long metal structure that ran straight ahead along the pier. Rudolph turned to his commanding officer. Where would the British have placed it? Maybe the dogs lost the scent. Weiss knelt and motioned for the German shepherds to approach him. They soon padded up, wagging their tails. The German officer patted both dogs on the heads while speaking in German. Bang. Claw. You find that codex for me. I'll take you to our new facility in Poland. You'll like it. There's all the bones you could ever want. Now go, and don't come back until you find it. Bring it back to me. Understood? The dogs barked, acknowledged their orders, and ran off inside the warehouse. As Weiss stood up, he turned around and saw two United States soldiers in green arm army uniforms pointing lawn rifles at him. 
Keep it up, you trout bastard. Just give me a reason to blow your head off. Lice had been so careful up until this point, only speaking English. The officer had not been aware that the British naval personnel had spotted the men in black heading towards customs and alerted their American counterparts. The soldier on the left approached with his finger squarely on the trigger of his rifle and approached the commanding officer of the German secret police. He pointed a barrel of his M1 Garand rifle at his forehead. Gunther, American, ich bin Criminal Commissar Weiss. The soldier's expressions contor contorted as their fingers squeezed harder on the trigger. I knew it. He's one of those Nazi bastards. I sparked and looked to his left, and then to his right. Finding quickly, he was alone. Rudolph was now missing. German superior officer smirked, and with open palms began to raise his hands into the air. It was not long until orders were barked at him in the, in the Yankee tongue, and he could feel the barrel pressed against the center of his back. Soldiers violently pushed to turn their prisoner around and walk along a narrow catwalk along the custom office building. Once, the catwalk was used by a fisherman who would frequent the docks to access the various parts of the port. The soldiers used it now to lead their captured prisoner towards the center hub where many ancillary docks connected to went further out into the deeper water. A detachment of soldiers had been stationed there watching the incoming mail and packages as they were offloaded from the newly arrived British ships. Display of the German man in black being led at gunpoint drew quite a reaction. Hey, look! Billy and Mark capture the Kraut! The American commanding officer, a tall, stern looking bald man, approached and reached into Weiss's coat. After rummaging through his, his pockets, he located the identity disk of the German secret police. Taking a look, he spoke out loud. Gunther, criminal assistant Rudolf. Welcome to the United States. Now, please tell me, what exactly is the Gestapo doing here in Baltimore? Weiss kept his mouth shut, clenching his teeth, while trying to figure out what had happened. How did Rudolph exchange his identity disk? And what was his subordinate up to? These thoughts were replaced with a new thought, as the American soldier sneered and forcibly restrained him. Kicking out his knees from behind, the German officer dropped down to the ground and was being strip-searched. As his head was driven down into the salty-smelling wooden boards that formed the deck of the pier, you just barely see Rudolph smiling in the distance. His subordinate officer's eyes turned coal black, and he faded away in a mist of black smoke. The last action that was visible was Rudolph tucking an identity disc into his black coat. Weiss cursed in German and watched as several rats and three hedgehogs ran past him. That was the last thing he saw as suddenly the world went black for the German officer. The critters only paid a fleeting bit of attention to the man in black as they continued to quickly run along the catwalks, heading towards the shoreline. Philip was bringing up the rear, keeping an eye out. Several times he could see the dogs sniffing and running towards them. The group would maneuver between and around and underneath the various crates and oily substances on the ground. That would be enough for the predators to lose the scent. 
No animal knew why the group was being chased by the German Shepherd dogs. But due to their small stature, they could quickly duck. Between the carts, around the carts, and between the fence boards. They squeezed through chain-like fences and through metal slats of barricades. Down the pier, make a right, down that dock, make a left, down the next pier, make a right. The port was gigantic. It was, it was like an endless maze. To make matters worse, Margaret was still recovering from childbirth. However, the need to flee to safety with her child outweighed any thought of stopping the rest. Abigail was crying and holding tight onto her mother's quills. The child looked back to see the look of terror on her father's face as he ran behind them, and the large dogs chasing after them. The predators had caught up to them once more, and she could see their eyes were locked onto them. Ever so tantalizingly close, the dogs would ram into the fence posts and squeeze their way through the far too narrow openings. The mice called out as they pointed to a blue pipe sticking out of the wall. That's right, Harry. The hedgehogs followed behind the mice and soon were ducking between and around large oat barrels that had been placed near to one another. Barrels were labeled molasses and smelled sweet as they leaked a sticky black substance from below the barrel. The dogs continued to bark and snarl as they started to attract human attention. The dock workers watched as the dogs were seemingly chasing something down the pier, and then all of a sudden came to a stop while barking loudly, and their paws tried to dig at something within the pier structure. The dog's nose is pressed underneath a wooden bench. Just as Philip darted into the blue rusted metal pipe with his, behind his wife and child. Despite the tight conditions, the critters continued to run far into the pipe until all lights ceased. In the pitch black darkness, they started to smell something horrid. After what seemed like an eternity, a foul-smelling quietness. Margaret bumped into a rat in front of her. Oh. Sorry, Mr. Rat. Do you know which way we're to go? The rat nodded and swished his tail back and forth while speaking. To the left. But there's a blockage ahead and the mice are working on it. The hedgehogs nodded and were thankful for the opportunity to rest. While their muscles recovered from the near constant exertion, echoes of the dogs were faintly muffled. Papa. Abigail spoke, which made both of her parents giddy with excitement. The baby hedgehog was facing her father when the word was spoken. He moved closer and touched his fuzzy nose with his child's nose, and grinned. Hello, Abigail. Don't worry, we should be safe now. The rat laughed. He <laughs> hee and moved his tail against the two adult hedgehogs to signal it was time to move again. Margaret with Abigail maneuvered around, and then Philip headed to the left until the pipe started to ascend at a slight angle. Although that slight angle soon grew much steeper, and it became difficult to climb. Abigail fell off of her mother's back and slid down the pipe to land on Philip's head. Philip laughed and said, Climb under the front part of my back, Abigail, and hold tight to my quills. The baby nodded and moved slowly into place and nestled between her father's quills and held on tightly. Higher and higher they ascended, until the pipe finally leveled off and widened into a much larger terracotta pipe. Within that pipe, there was a ledge that they could use to travel, and soon the group of critters were running along the highest right side of the pipe. Everyone watched this foul-smelling water 
and the occasional brown clumps flowed past them. Ardrick grimaced at their current circumstances, and although the smells were horrid, eventually, the faint smell of salty, fresh air from the outside world was coming from somewhere. The group continued on through the pipe until they came to a wide, rectangular stone box. And they looked up to see metal bars and a blue sky beyond them, peeking from above. The rats laughed and spoke in unison. Ah, I hate the sewer. But it's the best way to travel here. The humans never come down here. The hedgehogs nodded, and once Philip came to stand beside his wife, he felt Abigail climb back over to, onto her mother's back. The mice turned and waved at the hedgehogs. Goodbye, Philip. Goodbye, Margaret. Goodbye, Abigail. We have cousins here. I think. Their home should be somewhere around here. Maybe. Goodbye. Two gray rats nodded and waved while they spoke. Goodbye. We're heading up to the business district. The humans like to drop food on the ground. Hey, maybe we can get a crab cake. The hedgehogs waved and watched as their critter friends started to leave them one by one through the various connecting pipes in the sewer. Margaret pointed upwards. Philip, I really want to get out of this foul-smelling place. Please. The male hedgehog nodded and started exploring their new surroundings. It wasn't long until he found a rocky ledge that they could climb up up to where the metal bars were. The male hedgehog climbed up to the bars to test it was safe, and then back down. And then once more, Philip led the way for real, helping both his wife and his child up and out of the grate. The hedgehog could see they had once more reached a cobblestone-lined street. But the buildings looked completely different, and they were on each side tightly packed with all manner of signs. There were letters everywhere, which made Margaret's head spin. Abigail pointed. Mama. The hedgehog grinned again and looked to see their daughter pointing at a sign with green cursive letters. He also watched as a human man was thrown out of the building. He landed hard in the street, and then two other humans dressed in much better attire walked out to curse at him. We don't need any more stinking Irish in our bar. Go back to your own country. The man that was called an Irish watched as two other men returned inside the building. This allowed them to eventually stand up. The man smiled at the hedgehogs once he caught sight of them, and then turned to stagger up the road. Philip tugged at his wife's quills and started to head underneath a black wooden cart that was hitched up to a huge brown draft horse. As the critters were navigating underneath the cart, Abigail looked up to see that it was in fact a boy horse. She wiggled her nose and then looked down as the larger animal decided, unknowingly, to relieve itself. As the hedgehogs dodged and ducked quickly, eventually they made it so that around the, the, the hooves, and they were able to look up at the horse's face. Cupping his paws around his mouth. Hello, Mr. Horse! Draft Horse lowered his head, and his white mane fluttered in the breeze as brown eyes looked down onto the hedgehogs. Uh, 
Why, hello there, my porcupine friends. Is this your first time in Baltimore? The hedgehogs no nodded in unison, and Philip spoke again. Mr. Horse, we want to head to the countryside. Do you know which way it is? The horse nodded and stomped his front left hoof, causing a metallic ring to come from the horseshoe that was connected to it, as it made contact with a cobblestone. Head up that road. Make a left when you see the sign that points in three directions. That will take you to what the humans call a railroad. Follow the metal tracks, and that will take you out to the country. Thank you, Mr. Horse. Margaret called up while nodding and waving at the much taller animal. Draft Horse watched with a bemused look as the porcupine stampered off with what looked like, like a baby clutching onto its mother's back. The horse whinnied happily again and soon felt the wooden carriage behind it move as the two humans climbed on board. It was the same two humans that had thrown the Irish man out of the bar. Can you believe that stupid Irishman tried to get a job here? The one human said while his partner adjusted his black hat and checked the silver pocket watch. Hey, if you think the Irish are bad here on the East Coast, my uncle says the Chinamen are worse on the West Coast. Now, enough talk of foreigners. We gotta make the rest of these deliveries by four. The leather reins attached to the horse were jerked and soon the horse was taking its cue. It started to pull the heavy carriage forward. There's a red painted wood sign on each side of the carriage that read Beer, and a name that you'd be very familiar with. That name started to reflect in the windows on each side of the road as the delivery men guided their horse through the shipping district. As one of the men looked to the left to check for cross traffic, as this was still the age of horse-drawn carriages, in addition to motorized vehicles. He could see hedgehogs scampering along the sidewalk and up an alleyway. Shaking his head, he returned to his task and the carriage pulled forward. Hours passed, with the trio of hedgehogs following the horse's direction. Just as the large animal had advised, they soon found metal tracks of the railroad. The day slowly turned into night, until eventually they found a semi-safe spot to rest for the evening. Thankfully, their luck was continuing to hold out so far, as they found an empty wooden barrel that had been tossed along the train track for some reason. Inside the wooden interiors were charred black for some reason. And why that was, they didn't know. Nor did they care. Because as soon as they got inside the barrel, they immediately fell asleep. No one moved the entire night, not even Abigail. It wasn't until mid-morning the next day Philip was awoken to Abigail speaking. Mama, Mama, Papa, Papa. The light of the morning had arrived and suddenly their barrel moved. The trio of critters could see a human. He had the darkest skin they had ever seen before and he was towering above the open barrel. He didn't speak and he was sweating profusely in the humid conditions. The barrel was tossed up to another dark-skinned man who was loading them onto a flatbed of a freight train car. The em empty barrels were being lined up in a row and then tied into place with rope. The hedgehogs watched as the dark man disappeared and the blue sky was shining down from above. The 
constant noise of the humans working eventually quieted down, though. Which resulted in Philip wiggling his nose. He started to try to explore the barrel, seeing if there was a way out of it, but it seemed to be intact. Although, it wasn't long until Margaret pointed upwards. All the hedgehogs watched as a huge shoot moved overhead, and what resembled wheat started to pour in from above. The grain was a strange green color, and it was starting to fill the barrel. This resulted in both hedgehog parents starting to worry, as if they didn't do something, they'd be buried under the grain. Margaret, clutch the wood. As the grain fills up, we can use it to climb up. Abigail, hold on to Mama! Philip shouted as over the noise of falling grain and watched as his two female uh, family members nodded. The torrent of grain continued to fill up the barrel. The family of critters, following Philip's suggestion, climbed until they were able to reach the edge of the barrel. The male hedgehog climbed over the edge and slid down its side to reach the deck of the freight car. Abigail was tossed down to her father, and Philip thankfully caught her. Abigail giggled the entire time. Margaret was the last to slide down, while the green plant material continued to rain from above. It was starting to fall all around them. Philip quickly returned to his wife's side, and then picked up one of the green plants. It had a really unique smell. He started to nibble on it. It tasted bitter, but it didn't make his stomach upset. Philip nodded. Now, it's edible, whatever this stuff is. Margaret nodded and made a face while tasting the plant. Ugh. This stuff tastes terrible. Beggars could not be choosers, is the human saying, so the critters quietly munched away on the, their surrounding bounty. The dark-skinned men were busy working outside on the platform and watched as the last of the grain was loaded. A tall but skinny man looked at a muscular man and spoke. Any idea why they loaded all the hops into the whiskey barrels? The muscular man spoke with a thick southern accent. Heading to a distillery outside of Gettysburg, I heard. My uncle fought for the South there. His master sent him instead of his son. The skinny man made a face and then spoke. And now our new masters have us loading train cars for 25 cents an hour after we pay back the shovel fee, the uniform fee, the, the privilege of working for the company fee. Progress. The muscular man nodded and then spoke with a look in his eyes. Could be worse. Could be in Germany. Two men nodded and watched as the train started to pull forward, sending a loud screech into the air. The car shuddered and slowly started to move. The men turned and headed back to the loading station to return their tools and chatted on and off about the various topics of the day. I also watched as two shaggy German shepherd dogs came running past them with their noses occasionally pressed to the ground. The dogs were seemingly set to a task, and they were tracking something. The men watched as they reached the spot, stopped, sniffed, and then continued on. 
It was the spot where the hedgehogs had entered the barrel. And the dogs were sniffing and whining. Fang looked at Claw. Can't smell it anymore. Where'd it go? Claw sniffed again and looked at the departing train as it continued to pick up speed. There. It must be on that train. The dogs barked and then quickly bolted and started to run at their top speed, trying desperately to catch up with the train. Unfortunately for the Predators, the train had moved far too ahead and was only increasing its speed as it continued to pull ahead. When it became clear that they would not be able to catch the train, the two dogs slowed down but continued to follow the tracks. The hours turned into days, with the humidity quickly decreasing. The vibrant blue skies above soon turned into a dark gray. A cold rain pelted the open freight cars, and it was not long until the temperatures began to plummet. Philip was holding on to Margaret, and Abigail was pressed between their bodies. Body heat of the parents were necessary to keep the child warm. Baby Hedgehog was so happy to be close to her parents, and she snuggled and sighed happily as she fell asleep. The two parents pulled the bitter green plants around them, trying to insulate their bodies. Neither parent knew that the train was heading north and was winding its way through the state of Maryland. All they could see that once more they were traveling and their surroundings looked intimidating. The train was passing through long stretches of thick forests and then wide open grassy fields. The trees were bare and the chill of winter was heavy in the air. Philip was trying to stay awake as much as he could in order to protect his wife and child, though the call to sleep was becoming too hard to ignore. Eventually he passed out involuntarily, and the hedgehog slept for many long days and nights. A long freight train crossed the border into Pennsylvania, and continued ahead towards its destination. From time to time, the critters could occasionally hear the human train workers. They would walk by to examine the cargo. They would also perform a check for any persons that were riding the train that shouldn't be there. The men did not see the hedgehogs between the barrels, and passed on to continue their inspection. One by one, each of the freight train cars were checked until they reached the last car. It was a much bigger car and had an enclosed space within. This was known as a caboose, and this is where the train company did business, as well as cook for the railroad workers. The side of the car was painted in white with Baltimore and Harrisburg. As the pale-skinned men grabbed onto the railing, it swung down onto a narrow steel platform just outside the door. They had done this many times before, and today was nothing special. The lead worker turned the handle of the open door, which was a big round wheel, and soon the men entered the caboose. Both men chuckled and pointed at two very tired German shepherd dogs on the stained wood floor. Dogs were busy drinking water from metal bowls next to a two-burner coal stove that was red-hot and burning. On top of the cooktop, there was a black metal pot bubbling away. Got these ready, boys. Dinner should be in about 20 minutes. There was an elderly woman wearing an oil-stained house skirt standing at the stove and smiling at them. The smell of chicken paprikash was heavy in the air, and the two men sat down into a booth beside the dogs. One man reached out with a gnarled, coal-stained hand and petted the, the dog gently. 
I see you found some pets, Nona. The elderly woman nodded and pulled back her white hair. See? Poor boys. They were chasing this train since we left Baltimore. When we slowed out a bit, around that one bend, I helped them on board and gave them some water. If there's any food left after supper, I'll go get the leftovers. I made that Hungarian dish that the engineers suggested. The men nodded and watched as a, as a terrible ice storm started to pelt the outside of the caboose. Thoughts of the shards of ice were soon drowned out as the Italian grandmother started cursing in Italian at the one man for not washing his hands. Loud, boisterous laughter filled the warm caboose, and the banter of the old country's language was held in the air and echoed off the walls, while the bubbling pots on the, rattled around on the rusty stove. This is the end of part four. Pudgy hope you like the story. There will be five parts to this story, and Pudgy is now working on part five. If you like the story, can you please like this video? You don't have to, but Pudgy would appreciate it. Also, please subscribe to Pudgy so you don't miss out when Pudgy uploads Chapter 5. Thank you!